everyone. Okay, I'm Dr. Leslie Hadfield. I am the coordinator of the Africana Studies program here at BYU. And today we are going to begin by hearing from Aisha Lehman, who um, is going to explain, uh, walk us through an art installation that she did. Well, I'm really excited she will exp explain more about that. Um, and Aisha is, uh, oh, the art installation is called No Mixing, um, the, the title of it. Aisha is an art major and she is also minoring in sociology and Africana studies. So we will hear from Aisha first, and then we will hear hopefully from Casey Swartzen, um, whose paper is Improving Health Outcomes for Black Women by Correcting Physicians' Implicit Bias. And she is uh, an English major. Um, and so that should take us to almost three o'clock. After that, we will hear, we'll have a, a, a panel of two papers. And um, both of these papers were written in Dr. Kristen Matthews' English capstone class. And so we're excited to, to hear those together. We have Yidira Viamatau, I apologize if I messed that name up, I was trying to practice, um, who will give her paper Black Queer Here, a small collection of Black gay male voices regarding their unique identities and journeys towards self-acceptance. And Yadira is an English and Spanish uh, studies major, and she's graduating soon. We've got a few of our students graduating soon. Um, and then we'll hear from Kate, Caitlin Holzer, something large and old awoke, ecopoetics or ecopoetics and compassion and Tracy K. Smith's Wade in the Water. And she's also an English major. And so we're um, excited for um, all of those papers. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to, oh, let me say one more thing, I apologize. After this, we will announce the awards and that includes um, the paper awards as well as the Chantal Thompson Award in Africana Studies for the year. All right, let me turn the time over to Aisha. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Hadfield. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, oops. W. E. B. Du Bois famously stated, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. It asserts that a divide exists between black and white individuals on an institutional and interpersonal level, advantaging white people disproportionately. The housing market is, strong, is a strong example of this racial division. It is characterized by white individuals who are still granted privileges that black people are not and black individuals who continue to face discrimination that white people do not, makes race individuals, on the other hand, challenge this stark racial division theory by occupying a middle ground, privilege through their whiteness and disadvantage through persistent racism and anti-blackness. This intaglio print was an exploration of these ideas. The design was loosely based on a graph from a study by Ryan Gabriel analyzing the de neighborhood demographics where mixed race households reside. If you blur your eyes and rush past, the image looks fairly mixed and equitable. If you were to pause and observe the, the piece, you might notice rows of monochromatic homes, the scattered mixed tone homes in between, other patterns and clustering, and a general gradient with wider homes closer to the top of the landscape and blacker homes clustered towards the bottom. After printing multiple editions, I created a sequential mixed media series in order to tell a more holistic, historical, contextual, and emotional narrative. For each of these pieces, I will read the title and subtitle, followed by a discussion of the literature and research that influences the imagery. So this one is number one, no mixing, the purposeful and not accidental racial hierarchy that is segregation. The print here il illustrates the ongoing social phenomenon of segregation and the subsequent outcomes in people's lives. While households are the most segregated, while white households are the most segregated of all racial groups, where the average white residents lives in a neighborhood that is 75% white. This segregation persists independent of income as evidenced by the fact that black households making over $50,000 a year are just as segregated as those making minimum wage. There is more than just personal preference at play in the housing market. A, str a strategic system of oppression that varies dependent on a person's race has created the hierarchy that is segregation. Aisha? Um yeah. Oh, I wasn't sure if you were displaying that for, I can't see the, um, the print. Have you? I can see there? the prints. Oh, you can see it? Okay, so maybe it's yeah. a problem. Okay, 
All right, thank you, Charlotte. All right, keep going. Should I reshare it and see if you can see it again? Um, if it's just my, yeah, maybe. Was anyone else having that problem? Okay, it seems like other people can see it. So you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is print number two. The foreboding prospect of mixing. The South doesn't care how close a Negro gets, just so he doesn't get too high. The North doesn't ca how, care how high he gets, just so he doesn't get too close. This old saying refers to the Great Migration and subsequent white flight. The Great Migration began in the early 1900s during the Jim Crow era. Rural Black individuals and families moved to the North to find work as well as flee racist terrorism in the South. As the saying indicates, white Southern states use racist tactics to subordinate Black people, while white Northerners, on the other hand, flood the neighborhoods Black people began moving into. White residents claimed they were being invaded, taken over, and threatened. Those who could afford to move did, leaving to the suburbs. Number three, then the white man screamed, no mixing. White, fl white flight was one of two racist reactionary tactics to maintain residential segregation. The other tactic termed white fight used violent fear tactics and policies to maintain a racial distance. With the passing of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, segregation no longer had legal backing. In retaliation and direct contradiction to this supposed equalizing legislation, government aid such as the GI Bill and subsidized loans were strategically accessible to white residents and denied people of color. Real estate agents sold newly available urban housing at above market rates to black residents with no other options. Ghettos formed when black residents were forced into rundown slums that were often more expensive than the suburbs. Freeway and other infrastructure projects reinforced ghetto areas by relocating and forcing black residents into high rise public housing complexes that were cut off from basic municipal services. Poverty, dilapidated housing and overcrowding led to sickness, crime and, and homelessness. These outcomes reinforced white fear and stereotyping of black neighborhoods, thus justifying even more racist and discriminatory tactics such as redlining, withholding maintenance funding for infrastructure in black neighborhoods and gerrymandering school district boundaries, just to name a few. On a neighborhood level, white residents also used their power to keep undesirable black residents away from their neighborhoods. Initially, racial restrictions written in um, neighborhood contracts established that no person other than than one of the white Caucasian race could live in an area unless they were a domestic servant. Later, seemingly more covert contracts such as exclusionary zoning established the acceptable distance between houses, ensuring that no new black neighbors would attempt to build in the area. Sundown towns placed signs outside of their neighborhoods stating things such as whites only within city, within city limits after dark. We want white tenants in our white community or integration is a moral sin. When such messages weren't heeded and black residents moved in anyway, white residents turned to vandalism and even terrorism from breaking windows to lighting homes on fire. These oppressive inhumane tactics to create and maintain segregation translated into oppressively inhumane circumstances in the lives of black people. Black residents face unequal access to education, educational, economic and job opportunities. Intergenerational wealth in the form of home ownership, health, social capital was inaccessible. Um, basic needs such as healthcare, transportation, and food were cut off, not to mention increased exposure to environmental hazards. Urban unrest ensued out of sheer desperation. Uprisings took place within Black communities such as Watts, Harlem, and Detroit. While many white people viewed these communities as riotous looters instigated by undesirables, many Black residents knew these acts were an attempt to revolt against racial oppression and demand justice. Police continued to surveil Black neighborhoods for crime more than white neighborhoods, thus perpetuating overrepresentation of Black people in the criminal justice system and subsequent negative stereotypes. Ultimately, segregation was by no means organic or natural. It was deliberately built and maintained by white people in power using racist justification to reap racist results. While the use of red ink at first felt like a gross intrusion on the clean print, after unpacking the above mentioned historical context, perhaps the red ink was the only appropriate and illustrative means to embody the physical and psychological violence whiteness has historically inflicted on blackness. Notice how the ink smears on certain homes more than others and is often illegible. How might this illegibility embody the nuance of white, white fight? 
These themes and this imagery will return later in the series and give significant context for our contemporary racial climate. Number four, a happy post-racial era of mixing. Mixed bodies blurring the racial hierarchy that is segregation. This piece's title strikes an offhandedly optimistic tone in, com in comparison to the previous piece. First, it refers to a post-racial era, meaning the belief that we now live in a time when race is no longer relevant and racism no longer rampant, citing any racial progress as proof. This piece, along with each sequential work, will refer to and challenge this notion of a post-racial era by portraying ongoing racial hierarchies. Second, the title refers references mixed race individuals. Anti-miscegenation laws prohibited interracial marriage until the Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court, Court ruling in 1967. Anti-mixing sentiments were in large part an attempt to maintain segregation since mixed race people embodied a threat to the stark color divide and racial hierarchy. Nonetheless, the US witnessed a multiracial movement of sorts as early as the dismantling of miscegenation laws up until the more recent 2000 US census change, allowing for the option to select multiple racial categories. Despite this progress, the white racial hierarchy persists. While many researchers cite the growing multiracial population in America as the pivotal hope for a post-racial era, others argue there is that an adaptive racial hierarchy will simply ensue. Researchers who specifically study the residential mobility of mixed race people have found that these households simply occupy a middle ground, rendering the rigid racial order as partially mutable, but by no means dismantled. At first glance, this art piece seems beautiful. It reflects a blended, optimistic, multicultural, celebratory, post-racial landscape. It may feel especially so for those of us who have had the privilege to live at or near the top. It is quite a different story and reality for those who perpetually have been kept at or near the bottom. As later pieces will indicate, mixed race people have not fit, fixed the problem of segregation. A gradient is not integration. It is still a hierarchy. Number five. Um, mixing bodies, not homes. Um, using mixed bodies to evince a post-racial era despite the purposeful and not accidental monoracial hierarchy that is segregation. Certain studies indicate that, the US neighbor that US neighborhoods are becoming increasingly diverse. Unfortunately, this is not entirely true. Many of these studies showing increased integration rely on data that measure homes by single race categories and do not track multiracial identities. Researchers who have begun using data that allow for multiracial identification reveal that supposed integrated spaces are in fact inhabited by mixed race households. Ultimately, single race households um, such as monoracial white families or monoracial black families are still strikingly segregated and clustered. Once again, mixed race people and a lack of adequate data on mixed race identities emit a false sense of racial progress and mask persistent racial divisions. Number six, mixing, not matching. Social acceptance, depending on how approachable and white someone's phenotype and culture is in a post-racial era. How then are mixed race individuals sorted within this hierarchy? How do racist ideologies and policies sort interracial couples and multiracial individuals? One major factor is skin tone, or in other words, colorism. Colorism refers to a system of inequality that affords special advantages to lighter skin minorities um, because of their closer phenotypic resemblance and presumed genetic similarity to Eurocentric standards of beauty, morality, intellect, and status. For example, researchers have found that lighter skin toned Black people have greater opportunities than darker skin toned Black people in education, income, and employment, and are less likely to face discrimination in the health sector, the labor market, and the criminal justice system. One researcher notes that skin color should be understood not as a binary Black and white categorization, but rather as a continuum with associated privileges and disadvantages depending on proximity to whiteness. This proximity to whiteness also applies to behavior and presentation. White people are more accepting of non-white people when they act white or assimilate to white cultural norms. Number seven, um, a post-racial era white man whispers no mixing. This piece is not the same as print number three. Rather than depicting white fight tactics of the mid to late 20th century, this print addresses our society today and persistent measures used to maintain segregation. What similarities and differences do you notice? In terms of white flight, white residents continue to avoid or leave neighborhoods when non-white -white residents move in. One researcher calls this the racial tipping point, where white people accept a certain amount of racial mixing before they choose to relocate 
to wider monoracial areas. As far as white flight, white, while government aid such as the GI Bill no longer racially discriminate, this past injustice has impacted generations of inheritable fam familial wealth. It continues to cause residents more to live in ghetto or other impoverished neighborhoods than wider and higher socioeconomic areas and cities. While our modern legislation does not allow for explicit racial restrictions, covertly racialized tactics, including apartment applications specifically block people who depend on some form of government welfare or may have minor misdemeanors. Public housing and other government attempts to subsidize impoverished city residents have loopholes in which landlords and real estate agents can still use racial steering or deny applications based on their racist biases, making it extremely difficult to move out of impoverished areas. Municipal policies such as the placement of sewage treatment plants, city improvement and maintenance funding, gerrymandering school boundaries, property taxes determining school funding, and general lack of political representation are all used to perpetuate racist segregation. While sundown towns may no longer technically exist, consider how gated communities work to maintain racial divisions or Confederate flags outside of homes pose a violent threat against Black people. Neighbor inf inflicted vandalism and terrorism may have declined, but consider rampant evictions that leave people homeless, such as in Milwaukee, where roughly 16 families are evicted every day. Thousands of people must live on the streets every year because for, a myriad, for the myriad of reasons listed before, it is impossible for these individuals to keep up with rent. To this day, oppressively inhumane tactics used to maintain segregation translate into oppressively inhumane circumstances in the lives of Black people disproportionately. Black residents continue to face unequal access to education, economic, and job opportunities more than any other racial group. Intergenerational wealth in the form of home ownership, health, and social capital is often inaccessible. Basic needs such as healthcare, transportation, and food are cut off, not to mention increased exposure to environmental hazards. To this day, urban unrest ensues out of sheer desperation. To this day, uprisings take place within Black communities, which white people continue to label as riotous looters instigated by undesirables. To this day, Many Black residents know that these acts are an attempt to revolt against racial oppression and demand justice. Police continue to surveil Black neighborhoods for crime more than white neighborhoods, thus perpetuating overrepresentation of Black people in the criminal justice system and subsequent negative stereotypes. Once again, we see that segregation is not a natural occurrence. It is deliberately built and maintained by white people in power using racist justifications to establish racist policies. Number eight. Non, not racist white people who happen to not be mixing in a post-racial era. Works such as Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility and Eduardo Benilla Silva's Racism Without Racists explore the myriad of ways in which white people are able to talk about race through coded language, language that does not explicitly reference race, but nonetheless, nonetheless works to convey a racialized, um, excuse me, I lost my spot, um, that nonetheless works to convey a racialized, um, and racist message. Words such as good neighborhood or good schools both carry with them implications of a white and therefore desirable neighborhood. A white person does not need to explicitly state racial de demographics in order to illustrate the race-based point about an area. On the other hand, words such as urban, dangerous, underprivileged, diverse, and sketchy have the opposite implication of a black and therefore undesirable neighborhood. Other phrases with the same outcome include bad neighborhood, had to buy a gun, afraid to leave the house, you get what you pay for, or even you don't know how dangerous it is over there. They don't cotton to white folks over there. This last quote was said to a field researcher on his way to move into a predominantly black neighborhood. Other expressions such as, oh, I love mixed people, or I have black and Hispanic friends, I'm not racist, seek to prove that one celebration of diversity exempts them from a racist system in which we are all apart. Similar tactics such as my neighborhood as a black person imply that a single resident of color makes a neighborhood racially integrated. Racism doesn't exist or there is no problem, society is fine the way it is. Claim that we are in a post-racial era and completely ignores those who suffer the consequences of segregation. While phrases such as no black people want to live here, so, or everyone struggles, but if you work hard, um, ignores the structural forces of segregation. Coded language may seem minor, but it has monumental impacts. 
It works to perpetuate racist ideologies, which perpetuates racist policies, which perpetuates segregation, which perpetuates racial disparities. Ultimately, these words are used by white people in power and privilege to maintain an us versus them mentality. It ignores the humanity of those who are subordinated through the system. Once more, the ink on this image is blurred and difficult to read in places, sometimes completely illegible. What can that signify to us about the nuanced and covert place racism holds in our everyday conversations? Number nine, humanizing mixing, an unrealized post-racial era landscape. Integration has the power to equalize the opportunities and life outcomes of all individuals. These homes represent more than just categorical racial groups in a statistical study. They are individuals with complex identities, dreams and hopes, struggles and pains, and each with the human right for equality. When it comes to integration though, and the idealistic light in which we place it, we must be vigilant about our central aims and attitudes. Researchers generally talk about this in terms of people of color wanting to move to higher socioeconomic white neighborhoods, but seldom talk about the isolation and racism people of color must face residing in all white spaces. Integration should not mean black residents must assimilate to white idealized standards. This type of assimilationist racism does more harm to black individuals than empower them. The question then becomes, what are white residents doing? For neighborhoods to be safe spaces for people of color that can amplify their cultures? What are white residents doing to integrate themselves into non-monoracial white areas without imposing white idealized standards such as gentrification? Number 10, no mixing, the purposeful and not accidental racial hierarchy that is seg segregation. This presentation focuses primarily on white, black, and mixed wh white, black individuals but overlooks the histories and experiences of a myriad of other people of color in the housing market, including indigenous, Latinx, Polynesian, Asian, Middle Eastern, and many more identities that make up America. Because racial disparities in the housing market are largest between black people and white people, this information does indicate a great deal about the American landscape and spectrum of advantages and disadvantages therein. That said, black and white racial groups are not a monolith. My aim here is to break down stereotypes, not to uphold them. Unfortunately, this presentation does not go into the plethora of individual experiences within. While this information is generalized, it, is none, it should nonetheless strike us as unjust and unequal. We each play a role in this complex system of racism and inequality. It is this complexity and segregation and racism in America that drove me to interpret it in a visual form, thereby allowing a space for complexity and nuance. The principle seek to invite viewership to learn information, but more profoundly leave with an introspective mindset to contemplate where we each fit within this framing of American life. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. And you can imagine all of us applauding for you or applauding you. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. So this is how we're going to do it. If you have a question, ideally, you can raise your hand um, in, in Zoom. If that's difficult or you can't figure out how to do that, you can type in the chat or just unmute yourself um, and uh, let us know if you have questions. Okay, it looks like Charlotte has a question and then Kirsty. Hello, so I love the way Aisha mentioned um, that white people should recognize their role in integration. Um, but my question is really, how do you do that like the fine line between cultural appropriation and just like buying houses where you can afford to live without gentrifying an area. So just kind of the balance of integrating but not gentrifying and not cultural appropriation but not completely changing a neighborhood just by being there. Oh, that's such a good question <laughs> and a really hard question. Um, I think that section in particular, I was really inspired to write it from um, Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. And he brought up an excellent point about how we're so excited about the idea of integration, but we forget that we're not really talking about the actual like social and psychological needs of people of color when we talk about integration. It's more of like a feel good thing for people that may have been like advantaged. Um, and so I think that's the biggest thing is like, what are we doing to actually help or like listen to what those groups actually need versus what we think they need? I think that's that's really important. And I think you bring up the point of like, 
you know, how do you also fulfill your own personal needs? And I think um, I'm, I'm by no means an expert on this, but um, I feel like the more that we learn about these issues, the more that these issues will become a part of our own um, morals and our own like goals for where we want to live and the things that we want to do. And so I think um, it kind of becomes an inherent an inherent um, objective or goal as far as where you move into because you've been reading and learning about these things. So that's a very loose answer to your very profound um, question. <laughs> All right, Christy. Hey, Aisha, you did super great with your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so my, I think my, I'm mostly curious as to um, what inspired you to create the artwork specifically. And I want to know how you actually did the artwork because it's so interesting and it was really um, detailed and had just so much knowledge in it. And I just wanted to know how you came up with all of it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so it's too bad it has to be digital because a lot of this was very, I love working with um, collage and a lot of the paper that I used, all the mixed tones are all um, ink based um, colors and paper that I make myself. So um, there's a lot of nuance that's missed by seeing it digitally, which is unfortunate. Um, but that was kind of the whole point is like, I was reading all of these things that were really profound and meaningful, but um, I feel like research can only go so far as to like, to talk about something as socially constructed as race. It makes it seem concrete when really we know that it's socially constructed. And so I think art is an excellent medium to kind of talk about race in that way, in a more nuanced and natural way, the way that it really is. And as far as the technique, um, it's an intaglio plate. And intaglio is simply, um, it's a, a copper plate. So these are, um, how big are these? They're, um, it's a 12 by 18 pure copper plate that has been um, um, engraved by hand and through a chemical process, a very complicated chemical process that took me a super long time because I was having all these problems. Um, but then you put it through you know, a traditional printing press and each time you print it, you have to ink it for about half an hour and, and print it each time. And so that's what um, the base for all of these were. And then a lot of them were either um, collage, like I said, of these, um, these more skin tone um, papers that I had made. And then um, a lot of it is called oil or ink transfer drawings. And that was more of the, the red ink that you were seeing um, that has this kind of stippled um, effect. So I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you so much, Aisha. I saw that we had a, another hand raise, but unfortunately we have to keep moving along in our, um, in, in our program. So uh, if I am not sure, Casey, are you here? Um, yes, I'm here. Okay, I thought that might be you. <laughs> I've never seen you before. Okay, great. Um, we will turn the time over to Casey and then we look forward to hearing from her. Awesome, thank you. And Aisha, that was amazing and incredible artwork and the talent, so impressive. Um, so I'll be sharing my screen for this presentation, um, but unfortunately I don't have the artistic talent. So we're just gonna be sticking on this screen and then I'm uh, excited to answer questions at the end. <clears throat> BDO Asmarum, fourth year medical student at the University of California, San Diego, spoke to the Washington Post last October. Grimly, she stated, Quote, in my community, the saying is, you only go to the doctor if you're about to die. Asmarum's parents immigrated from Eritrea, a country in East Africa. She was raised in Oakland, California, 15 minutes from my hometown. As a kid, I went to Oakland Children's Hospital for a major surgery and a subsequent week-long hospital stay. The nurses and doctors were so nice to my mom and me, even as I made a major dent in their candy supply. Asmarum's experience in the Oakland hospitals was starkly different. She saw, quote, physicians who were disrespectful to her family and uncaring about treatment for her mother's psoriasis, hypertension, and diabetes. My mom and I are white. Asmurm and her mom are black. The US medical system was built in part through abusing black women, and the impacts of that abuse reach into the implicit and unconscious biases of today. Health outcomes for black women are among the worst in the United States. At rates disproportionate to their white counterparts, black women die from pregnancy and childbirth, 
breast cancer, cervical cancer, and heart disease. Put a different way, if health, if health equity were an American reality, 2,400 fewer black women would die from breast cancer every year. Current infant mortality rates for black women would drop by 35%. The average life expectancy for black women would increase by four years and the poverty rate for black women and their families would be cut by half. These are significant hypotheticals and they are attainable. However, to understand and solve these inequities, it is important to understand some basics as to when and where they began. The history of medicine is replete with fundamentally racist and inequitable care towards black women. In the dawn of the 19th century, one of America's most prominent scientists, Samuel Morton, set out to prove that, quote, differences between black people and white people went beyond culture and were more than skin deep. In essence, he, quote, developed the science of race to suit his own prejudices and got the actual science totally wrong. Still, early American physicians accepted Morton's discoveries as legitimate so that even as they advanced medicine, they instilled racism. Many 19th century racial myths persist today. One such myth assumes that black people, particularly black women, are impervious to pain. Before 1847, when American medicine formally established basic, basic ethical practices, this specific myth excused phys physicians conducting excruciating, unanesthetized procedures on black slave women. Dr. James Marion Sims, the still lauded father of gynecology, depended heavily on unanesthetized black women to develop repair techniques for vesicovaginal fistula, a common childbirth complication. Once perfected, he performed this postpartum technique on white women. The only difference? White women received anesthesia. Summarily, these antebellum era American doctors believed in the, quote, inferiority of women and the double inf inferiority of black women. Sims' omission of anesthesia for black women undergoing an obviously painful procedure is only one example of the power of racial myths in medical discovery. In the era of COVID-19 with a 95% effective vaccine produced and approved worldwide in under a year, there is no doubt that we live in an era of unprecedented medical innovation. Still, racial biases established years ago persist in the explicit education and subconscious psyche of today's physicians and physicians in training. Covert implicit bias runs rampant and impacts decision-making in powerful ways. This is true even for medical professionals who genuinely want to offer high quality objective care to all their patients. In training these healthcare providers against racism and bias, however, medical schools largely fall short. In this essay, I explore the connection between physician implicit bias and health outcomes for Black Americans, specifically Black women. I aim to prove that the road to health equity in America must necessarily include major efforts by medical schools and affiliated health systems of all levels to provide significant anti-racist and anti-bias training. Before ever seeing a physician, patients are universally subject to non-medical health factors called social determinants of health. Five major categories make up these determinants, policymaking, social and physical factors, individual behavior, biology and genetics, and health services. The quote, unfair and avoidable differences in health status seen within and between countries follow a social gradient. The lower the socioeconomic position, the worse the health. In the United States, where socioeconomic position correlates with race, Black Americans are disproportionately represented in lower socioeconomic strata. Thus, in the US, racism is a major social determinant of health. Social factors pervasively influence what happens outside a hospital, and American society puts its Black citizens at higher risk for poorer health long before their first doctor's visit. However, medical schools and affiliated health systems are connected to socioeconomic differences and access to, use of, and quality of healthcare vary by socioeconomic status. Knowing that Black Americans are disproportionately represented at lower socioeconomic levels, we can logically conclude that Black Americans are also at higher risk for substandard medical care. But substandard medical care also relates to the individuals responsible for providing it. And these individuals are just as much a part of American society as everyone else, subject to their own set of unconscious biases. Moreover, the medical system of which, of which they become a part largely fails to confront its historical and systemic racial bias. A growing body of research confirms that implicit bias significantly impacts physician decision-making. One publication sums it up, quote, implicit racial bias influences behavior in unintentional but powerful and systematic ways, profoundly influencing clinical decision-making. Two key ideas in this statement are intention and power. Regarding intention, Howard Ross, a leading academic on identifying and addressing unconscious bias says, quote, most unconscious bias is caused by well-intended people with blind spots. 
In anti-bias training, criticizing those influenced by bias is not the answer. That would mean criticizing everyone. Additionally, addressing bias doesn't mean eliminating bias. Making assumptions and categorizing others is a completely natural response that allows human minds to organize and make sense of their world. Instead, for physicians, addressing bias is a question of learning to dance with it and minimize its effect. Then, regarding power, implicit racial bias profoundly influences clinical decision-making. If, as suggested, medical schools and affiliated health systems proactively train their physicians to minimize the effect of their implicit bias, it follows that the training would have profound positive implications for patients. This would be especially true for patients of color. Part of the reason Black Americans are currently at higher risk for substandard care is because medical education has yet to thoroughly confront race in its curriculum. Dr. Damon Tweedy, a Black psychiatrist at Duke University School of Medicine, writes that, quote, for far too long, medical schools have neglected to tackle the full complexity of race in their curriculums. Dr. Tweedy points to two major distractions that take away from this endeavor. The first is medical school's disproportionate and inaccurate, quote, focus on race as a category signifying distinct biological difference, a belief that dates back to slavery. Today, it's understood that the concept of race is a social construct and that it has no genetic or scientific basis. Further, between people of different skin colors, genetic differences are very few and quote, the variation that does exist is patterned geographically, but not racially. Still, medical school curricula traditionally enforces race as a diagnostic shortcut with study materials dividing patients by racial categories. This approach is inherently flawed because health status is much less a specific result of skin color than it is how society treats that skin color. Dr. Dorothy Roberts explains, quote, it's not that race is irrelevant to health, but it's not relevant to health because of innate differences. It's relevant because racism affects people's health. Medical schools then are antiquated in the practice of teaching and focusing on race as a category of health. It is the social implications and impacts of racism that affect health outcomes, not fundamental biological differences. This problem is not an issue of semantics. Race-based biology, a tame term for what is actually scientific racism, gave way to what Dr. Tweedy identified as, quote, medicine's most egregious sins. In the last century, these include, but are not limited to, the institutionalized practice of forced sterilizations of Black women, the covert testing of mustard gas on Black soldiers by the military in World War II, and the tracking of untreated syphilis in Black men by the Tuskegee Institute and the federal government under the guise of free health care. All of these happened within the last century and some like forced sterilizations continue today. While these practices should be injustices of the past, there is a quote ideology that fuels them and it stubbornly lingers in the minds of medical students, providers and schools. So where anti-black biases are either implicitly reinforced or not explicitly corrected in medical education, racist ideologies and biases allow for and lead to discriminatory medical practices that exacerbate racial differences in health outcomes. Studies have successfully measured racial bias exacerbating racial differences in pain treatment. A 2016 publication was the first to measure medical providers' racial bias in pain perception and racial bias in pain treatment and recommendations. It conducted two comparative studies, one with a group of white laypersons, people without medical training, and the other with a group of white medical students and residents. White laypersons, it found, quote, endorse at least some beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites many of which are false and fantastical in nature. Of the more than 400 white medical students and residents they surveyed, half of them endorsed the same false beliefs. Further, those hundreds of medical students and residents with racial biases were more inaccurate in their medical recommendations towards black patients. The study concluded then that quote, racial bias and pain perception has pernicious consequences for accuracy and treatment recommendations for black patients and not for white patients. Hoffman's study thus also concludes that implicit bias specifically connects with strongly negative health consequences, and these outcomes most negatively affect Black patients. By empirically connecting for the first time racial bias and pain perception and racial bias and pain treatment, this 2016 study proves the need for further measuring the impacts of physician bias specifically on health outcomes for Black patients. Studies had already found, more generally, that most healthcare providers appear to have implicit bias in terms of positive attitudes towards whites and negative attitudes towards people of color. Hoffman's work clarified that these biases are specifically anti-Black, reflecting racist ideologies established years ago. That 50% of white medical students and residents still endorse such beliefs is stunning in part because many healthcare providers take an oath that they will do no harm. 
Their job is explicitly to help, to do what they can to improve patient health and to withhold judgment and personal opinion. However, as a 2016 study proves, by failing to correct their racial biases, physicians inadvertently do harm to their black patients. As, as significant as racial, racial bias proves to be in medicine, adding gender bias creates intersectionality, the quote, interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender, regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Intersectionality is relevant here because it introduces the idea that implicit racial bias is not the only bias influencing physicians. For black women, implicit gender bias is added to racial bias and the quote, combined adverse effects of implicit bias towards people, excuse me, towards persons with intersecting social identities are stronger than the separate effects of a single identity, a quote, double inferiority. The combined adverse effects of intersectional bias against black women extend to the type and quality of healthcare they are provided. For example, physicians often misdiagnose endometriosis in black women in favor of pelvic inflammatory disease. Endometriosis is a disease in which the tissue that lines the womb is present outside of the uterus. Physicians disproportionately mistake this in black women for pelvic inflammatory disease, which is typically transmitted sexually. The first mistake is a diagnosis. The second is the misdiagnosis in favor of a sexually transmitted disease. These misdiagnoses are directly related to a centuries old bias that hypersexualizes black women the Jezebel. This slave era myth identified the black woman as quote, immoral, sexually promiscuous and sexually available. A mistruth rooted deeply in an ugly mix of racism and misogyny, this myth was used to justify the rape of enslaved women by their owners. While the system appears to have been largely eradicated, the biases were not. Another 2016 study revealed that there are quote, negative st stereotypes about black women related to sexuality, motherhood and socioeconomic status that are consistent with the historical images of the Jezebel and welf welfare queen archetypes. In other words, racial myths are alive and well, confirming that more work needs to be done to understand the impacts of implicit bias and stereotyping on health outcomes for black women in the United States. Because there's a lack of widespread research on the impacts of intersectional implicit bias on the health out healthcare outcomes of black women, it's currently difficult to know the scope and depth of how intersectional bias influences physicians' decision-making. It's not impossible though to surmise that black women's health outcomes at large could be improved if implicit bias were to be proactively addressed early and often in physician careers. The statistical maltreatments of black women run rampant in this country. Many black women report being dismissed, ignored, or considered unknowledgeable about their own bodies by their primary care physicians. This is more important than just human decency. By dismissing their patients' reports about pain, physicians fail to provide quality healthcare to black women. Even a surface level introduction to health inequities for black women helps underscore the sobriety and scale with which these systemic changes must be implemented. Right now, compared with white women, black women are 22% more likely to die from heart disease, 71% more likely to die from cervical cancer, and 243% more likely to die from pregnancy or childbirth related causes. Health conditions like uterine fibroids that disproportionately impact black and other minority women receive very little government research funding. They are represented in clinical trials that require consent and are overrepresented in studies that do not. In presenting this conglomeration of health outcome statistics, I hope to emphasize how broadly health inequities impact Black women in America, and all of this before the pandemic. Further, while not an isolated issue of quality health care, the medical system is complicit. A discrepancy exists between the responsibility of the institution, the professional, and the patient. The government determines who gets funding. The researcher ensures diverse consensual re representation in order to make their results applicable to all populations. The doctor provides quality unbiased care. The patient follows doctor's orders and the patient heals. While these are the purported roles, they are not the demonstrated realities. So much is outside of the black patient's control, but because of unchecked institutionalized racism and bias, the black patient is most consistently and most negatively affected. Institutionalized intersectional implicit bias is not yet levelly addressed in medical schools and affiliated health systems and the cost is high. Thus it is time for medical institutions to work proactively to confront and eliminate implicit bias in their current and future medical providers. In 2015, medical students around the United States banded together and formed a student run organization called White Coats for Black Lives. In their annual comprehensive reports, they correctly identify that medical schools are, quote, tremendously powerful in American healthcare and have a responsibility to promote racial justice in medicine. 
To correct for this, part of White Coats for Black Lives mission is identifying and articulating how medical centers can promote racial justice and implement institutional change. In 2019, they published their racial justice report card, which evaluates 17 medical schools, including 10 of the most prominent and highly funded in the country on their efforts towards promoting social justice. One evaluative metric is a medical school's anti-racist training and curriculum. In their report, White Coats for Black Lives identified what we've, what we've already learned. Lecturers still explain race, not racism, as a risk factor for disease, tool for diagnostic reasoning, or predictor of treatment response. Further, many schools implement but do not take necessary measures to ensure that all students and faculty receive unconscious bias training. While most schools provide some form of education on social determinants of health, they do not uniformly provide instruction on the sociopolitical or non-biological nature of race. These 17 schools, all of them highly respected and highly funded, fall short when it comes to teaching the most accurate science of our day. Race-based biology, as discussed, is not only antiquated, it's fundamentally incorrect. Explaining race, not racism as a risk factor, serves only to miseducate future healthcare providers. Medical schools and affiliated academic medical centers have the important responsibility of providing the highest quality education to their students and faculty, and should thus be held accountable for providing the highest quality anti-racist curriculum and anti-bias training available. White Coats for Black Lives recommendations to medical schools can be found online. For future physicians to provide equitable care, their education must include accurate principles about race and racism, and anti-bias and anti-racist training must necessarily become the rule, not the exception. In applying to medical schools, advisors urge applicants to dig deep beyond the predictable I wanna help people essay. Embedded in this cliche, however, is a truism. People become doctors because they want to help. Medical trainees expect fairly that their medical education will equip them enough that they will be good practitioners. However, if even the best medical schools do not make anti-bias and anti-racist training a top priority, they award MDs with an asterisk. Medio Asmaram, the UCSD medical student mentioned at the beginning of this essay, never wanted to be a doctor. In fact, her experiences in the Oakland healthcare system made her dislike physicians. It was not until college that she learned her experiences as a black woman in the US medical system were measurably common, and she determined to change the system from the inside. In 2021, black women like Asmarum represent 4.6% of US medical students and 13.4% of the US population. While Ms. Asmarum is part of a precious few to soon be addressed as doctor, the odds are still stacked against her and they need not be. Rather, through her individual efforts, as well as those by academics, student groups, and nonprofit organizations around the country, now is the time for U.S. medical education to leave its failings behind and enact an enlightened curriculum. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Casey. I see a few people applauding at home. That's great. Um, okay, so we have a few um, minutes for questions for Casey. Again, um, in case you came in while she was uh, talking, we can take those on the, in the chat, but um, if you can raise your hand uh, in Zoom, either with the uh, button or in your own video, that would be great and we'll, we'll do it that way. Any questions for Casey? Maybe while people are thinking, um, Casey, if you could put the link to the um, White Coats for Black Lives in the chat, that would be great. And Definitely, then, yeah. Thank you. And it looks like Kristen Matthews, Dr. Matthews has a question. Thank you. Hi, Casey. Thank you for this paper. You and I have talked a lot about this, but I was wondering um, if you could share with folks uh, kind of your research methodology, because you bring together lots of different resources here. I mean, you've done your homework. So I was hoping you could share with folks where you went, how you brought together this material so you could make this argument? Sure, yeah, thanks for that question, Dr. Matthews. Um, it, was, it was a conglomeration of, of resources. I, I was formerly for the first couple, few years of um, undergrad was pre-med. And so I became really familiar with, you know, medical research and just science research in general and, and the approach that these publications take in order to kind of make their claims. And so, I think a lot of my, my research is informed by the experiences that I had as a research assistant in the biology de department at BYU. Um, but at the same time, I'm an English major and I recognize the power of, of anecdote, the power of story and the power of 
you know, personal experiences. And so I started in my research with a lot of, you know, just looking up scientific publications. Um, that's what I've learned to trust um, as, a, as an ex pre-med student. Um, but then once I kind of really got a grasp of, of the science behind it, um, I went further out towards the, you know, the, the non-academic publications where whether it is, you know, a professional or just an individual sharing their experiences, I can kind of round out and make human um, the statistics that, that I was sharing. So I hoped to kind of to, to balance that and, and make sure that it's, it's emphasized how, how human this experience really is. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Casey. Okay, Samantha Larkins has a question. Hi, yeah, I'm curious if in your research for like the specific curriculums in medical schools, if you were able to find a curriculum or like policy in place um, that seemed to pretty effectively teach to how to break down these implicit biases in practicing medicine? Um, that's a great question. So I think for, in my research, what I found most effective in terms of addressing effective curriculum would be the White Coats for Black Lives, their publications, because they, they're the ones that really, you know, nitpicked the the effective curriculum and identified ways that you know schools are doing well and, and ways that schools can improve. Um, I think one of the issues is that, again, like of the 17 schools they evaluated, 10 of them, they're the top 10 medical schools in the country and none of them did well. None of them got like an A on the report card. And so um, one of the issues is that there, there isn't really a centralized effort or a focused effort to make really effective curriculum. And so, um, they've been previously, they've been more scattered. And so I think, I think one of the places that kind of does suggest that um, more centralized uh, curriculum is, is this publication by the students. And I'm guessing, this is just a guess, that they're working too with the faculty and, and, and um, professors at their institutions as well to, to really hone in and centralize it a little bit more. All right, thank you so much. Um, we're going to be moving along. Um, again, another round of applause for Aisha and Casey. I, it, it's so interesting to see these elements uh, placed next to each other. We have housing and health and the different perspectives on it. So thank you for enlightening us um, and for all the great work and for being willing to share it. We appreciate that. So well done. We're going to shift now to literature, and that we're excited about this next panel. We'll first hear from Yadira, and then we'll hear from Caitlin, and then we'll take questions for both of them um, after they've both presented, since they're uh, more related papers. So we'll go ahead with Yadira. Thank you. Um, let me just share my screen really quick. Um, Okay, great. The central question of the seminal film Moonlight, directed by Barry Jenkins, who is you, man, is not only posed by Kevin, the friend and love interest, the main character, Black Sharon, but to all Black queer individuals who find representation in the film. This inquiry, which has a clear distinction from who are you, asks not only who someone is on a surface level, but who they are at their core. This complex question, asked in African-American vernacular English, is not simple, for it pushes the respondent to keep it 100 and figure out who their truest self is. It is a challenge to be open and honest, not only with the interrogator, but most importantly, with themselves. To live honestly, genuinely, and unapologetically means to truly know who one is and to embrace that wholeheartedly, regardless of the opinions of others. The lifelong journey of self-discovery is made up of moments that are simultaneously terrifying, complicated, freeing, and joyous. For members of the LGBTQ plus community, the exploration and acceptance of one's gender identity and or sexual orientation is most often painful and laborious before it becomes liberating. 
Fear of judgment, discrimination, and disapproval holds individuals back from coming out and living their most authentic lives. When coupled with an ethnic racial minority status, this introspective process becomes increasingly complicated. Identifying with multiple minority labels not only opens one up to an escalation of oppression and alienation from the white and cisgender heterosexual majority, but also from unfair discrimination within their own communities. Homophobia found within their ethnic racial community and the racism found in the LGBTQ plus community make the journey to self-acceptance, self-love, and overall happiness that much more treacherous. Through the examination of multiple mediums, including the documentary films Kiki, Paris is Burning, and Tongues Untied, the autobiography All Boys Aren't Blue, a memoir manifesto, and various articles and blogs, um, I found and connected multiple themes, conclusions, and universal ideas that the Black queer individuals presented in their respective works. The first being a common journey from silence and fear to then making peace with the multiple layers of identity that all equally make up a Black queer individual. Additionally, the freedom to be one's truest self that comes from shattering stereotypes and expectations around Black masculinity. Furthermore, the value in community and finding others who validate and share one's experience. Finally, the importance of representation from sources like Moonlight. It is the goal of this work to not only provide context and real life examples of the pains and joys around being a black queer person, but to most importantly, show the beauty, perseverance and courage of this heavily marginalized and misunderstood subset of individuals. Some black queer individuals shared how they were protected and taught how to perform straightness by their straight black counterparts. George Johnson, in an article published in Ebony, described how his family taught him to protect himself, saying, my uncles and cousins taught me how to be tough and perform straightness as a means to protect myself, but it was also a curse when it came to being comfortable in my own identity as a Black gay man. Yes, Johnson was given the tools to keep him safe from others who are not accepting of his queerness, but he was not taught how to embrace himself and to be open about who he was. His uncle and cousins were doing their best to keep young George out of harm's way, but at the same time, they forced him to silence his identity as a Black gay man. Johnson, just as other Black gay men on their journey of self-discovery and acceptance, had to learn how to become his own advocate and protector of his authenticity. Marlon Riggs, the gay Black director of Tongues Untied, came to this same conclusion saying, no one will redeem your name, your love, your life, your manhood, but you. No one will save you, but your silence is costing. Your silence is suicide. To exist as a gay Black man is to live a life of fear, fear of white people, fear of queer white people, fear of Black cisgender heterosexuals. The external battle fought against seemingly everyone, everyone, even those who claim to protect and support you, translates itself into a battle of internalized hate and homophobia. Queer Black individuals harbor a fear of not only being found out, but also of living authentically. This overabundance of anxiety and terror is most often coupled with silence and a rejection of the true self. Marlon Riggs voices his silence, saying, silence is my shield, it crushes. Silence is my cloak, it smothers. Silence is my sword, it cuts both ways. Silence is the deadliest weapon. Riggs expresses the two sides of silence and how it can provide protection and safety, but that it also hurts the user. Remaining silent and pushing against one's truth stifles their blossoming, their growth, and their happiness. Silence is what is used to keep the Black gay man alive and to keep them safe from homophobia and racism, but it is also what kills the soul and identity of the human being. Black queer individuals often are silent and watered down versions of themselves as a means of, protecting, of protection from white people and most importantly from homophobic members of the black community. Through the many mediums consulted for their work, their, for this work, there is a common thread of, of fear of being outed, alienated and discriminated against by members of the family and other black people. When there is an abundance of discrimination and hatred coming from non-Black members of society, it is, a terif is terrifying to think of one's support system turning its back on them because of their sexual or orientation and or gender identity. The fear of losing acceptance from other Black people is what keeps gay men, Black gay men silent and afraid. The strongest internal demon that gay Black men have to overcome to present as their most authentic self <laughs> is that of Black masculinity. Black masculinity is the amalgamation of negative stereotypes of Black men that are supported by white and Black communities alike. These negative stereotypes that portray Black men as violent, hypersexual, and incompetent beings are gross expectations for all Black men to live up to. They are confined to a box of hypermasculinity that dismisses and even spits upon those who are weak uh, or feminine. Black communities support this view of Black men because it is one of the few ways that they're given power or recognition in this country. 
These men who less than a few centuries ago were viewed as less than human are taught to believe that they can only hold space as men if they adhere to these dehumanizing stereotypes. This narrow view of manhood is further complicated when one identifies as homosexual. This identity is seen as feminine and unparalleled to the black male experience, so those who are queer and black have a difficult time reconciling with their multiple layers of identity. Jamel, a black gay man, describes his experience of black masculinity and being gay, saying, I think that black men especially have always felt the need to act manly, dominant, and sometimes aggressive. Maybe this is down to a long history of mistreatment and repression. Maybe we feel there is a need to assert our strength and authority in a world that has constantly tried to pit us as unequal. However, this mentality directly opposes the general stereotype of homosexuals as people who embrace their femininity. As a black gay man, I suffered an identity crisis. Jamel relays the idea that black masculinity stems from years of oppression and a secondary status in this country. For black men, it is an obvious response to be overly aggressive, overly sexual and overly dominant to assert their manhood so as not to be seen as less than human again. This intergenerational thought process, however, has made it increasingly difficult for queer black men and other black men in general to exist outside of the confines of black masculinity. They're not given the freedom to love men, to be feminine or to even show emotion. They are not given the freedom or space to simply exist as human beings. After being seen as weak and less than a white man's equal for generations, black men as a whole aim to be hypermasculine so that their masculinity and humanity can never be questioned. Just as silence was a double-edged sword that also cuts the user, hypermasculinity in black communities hurts black men, queer and otherwise. This narrow definition of manhood that is negatively backed by white society, as well as unfortunately supported by the black community, stifles the growth and happiness of queer and straight black men alike. The strict confines of who they are taught they shouldn't be doesn't leave room for who they truly are inside and who they aspire to be. With this concept in mind, it is clear to see how Black gay men have an identity crisis when it comes to being both Black and gay. When both of these labels have extremely different views of masculinity, they find that they can only be free when they realize that there is a reality outside of stereotypes and the narrow view of manhood. As Black queer men start to be accepting of their layers of identity and their ability to exist outside of the binary and societal expectations, they can more fully embrace their sexuality, their gender, their manhood, and their identity. One sentiment commonly expressed throughout the personal stories of queer Black individuals was the importance of finding a family, community, or home within other queer Black people. This search for camaraderie and kinship allows the personal journey of self-love and acceptance to be more pleasant and far less lonely. It also provides validation and visibility from experiences being shared among other queer Black people. An interviewing Kiki talks about their experience with finding a community within the gay ball scene of New York saying, I was a person who was lost. I was a person who wasn't confident in my ability to do. Because I found a community that appreciates me and all of me, I'm able to be myself. As shown in this example, a community formed from common experiences and queer identities allows for growth, confidence, and acceptance of self. It is difficult to blossom as a queer Black person when there's a lack of support, so finding appreciation and acceptance within other queer Black people allows one to be themselves fully, authentically, and unapologetically. Furthermore, queer Black individuals rarely find acceptance in their homes and families after coming out in their gender identity and or sexual orientation. The toxic Black masculinity previously touched on is one of the reasons they are alienated or disowned. The homophobia that their, family exhibit, that their families exhibit stems from religion and African-American culture as a whole. With this in mind, these same queer Black people find a new family and home within the queer communities that embrace them. One interviewee from the documentary Kiki describes this common experience of newcomers onto the gay ball scene noting, when you come onto the scene, you create a family. You have gay brothers, gay sisters, and you can pick your gay parents or your gay parents pick you. You know, you, you find the people you fit in with and everybody loves you as if they're family. The idea of a house or a voguing drag team is presented in this documentary. These houses have gay mothers and fathers and even have a name similar to a familial last name that binds all the members together. It is within these structures that queer black individuals find new families and most importantly, a space where they feel accepted, loved and valued for being their complete selves. When learning to accept and love themselves fully, a universal idea presented within the various experiences of queer Black people is that there needs to be acceptance of all their identities and an acceptance that these separate labels make up the whole and cannot be separated or unequally valued. In the first section of their work, there was an, of this work, there was an understanding that these queer Black individuals were trying to silence their queer identities. They would try to disaffirm its presence and most importantly, its value in their lives. 
George Johnston emphasizes his experience in his own life, noting, if I couldn't see parts of my own blackness as respectable, there was no way I was ready to see my queerness as respectable either. But now I know that queerness is, an, as part, is a part of blackness and that there is no blackness without queer people. An idea present in this quote from Johnson is that he had to not only learn to respect and accept his queerness, but also his blackness. There is a unique and complex journey that black and other people of color go through, and that is learning to love and accept themselves as separate from the white majority. Media, education, and everything else in the US teaches BIPOC individuals that they're less than, that they aren't beautiful, and that they aren't valuable or worthy. This indoctrination of white supremacy is difficult to unlearn. Finding pride in one's ethnic racial heritage is extremely difficult as it is, but doing so with another label of queer is increasingly challenging. Queer Black individuals who are confident, happy, and free aren't given enough credit for the treacherous internal battle they live through whilst fighting an external one. Ose R. Hagen, a student from Deontay Johnson's article in GLAAD, provides their experience in learning to accept themselves fully. There's this misconception that my Black identity, my African identity, my queer identity, and my trans identity can't exist in one body. There's no inherent conflict within my identities. I belong in both communities, and there's a space for me in both communities without me having to compromise any one part of my identity. The most poignant part of Oregon's account is their ability to voice how their identities are not inherently conflicting. What makes their identities conflict is the internalized hatred and shame that they're taught to feel about themselves. White supremacy and cisgender heterosexual norms are a negative factor in our Hagen and other queer black individuals journeys towards self love and acceptance. They're not raised learning love and pride, but rather are taught how to be straight or how to silence, uh, how to be silent as a form of protection, or how to fit into mainstream society. This way of living, of surviving, does not provide one with happiness, and it isn't until these ways of thinking and living are unlearned and changed that there can exist self love and acceptance. At the end of his essay-like documentary, Marlon Riggs describes how as a proud, self-assured, and self-accepting gay Black man, he no longer is burdened by silence. He says, I was mute, tongue-tied, burdened by shadows and silence. Now I speak, and my burden is lightened, lifted, free. The further queer Black individuals go on in their journey for self-love and acceptance and authenticity, the freer they become. There is freedom in loving oneself, freedom in living authentically and un unapologetically freedom in being 100% true to who one is deep inside. When this confidence and peace is found and built upon, it no longer matters what other people think and say. It no longer matters if people approve because the only one who truly matters is the individual within. An interview in Kiki describes this reality and how it exists within the queer ball scene saying, when people step onto the ballroom floor, they're not just competing in the category, they're telling their story. So someone who walks is telling you, I am beautiful, this is who I am. I'm lovely no matter what you say, no matter what you think. Again, in this example, one can see how self-acceptance provides one with the confidence to define their beauty, identity, and worth. These queer, individual, queer Black individuals are free enough to see and validate their value, even if no one else does. Not being held back and defined by societal standards and norms truly provides one with space and freedom to live and present how they desire. Finally, letting go of the weight of fear, guilt, and shame that previously burdened these Black queer men is how they can love themselves and ultimately be free. The final section of my work provides the importance of representation for queer Black men. Unfortunately, there does not currently exist a plethora of media that addresses queer Black experiences. Furthermore, the minimal work that does exist is most often not created by queer Black individuals. Paris is Burning and Kiki, the documentaries, were directed by white women, and even Moonlight, although based on the semi-autobiographical play in Moonlight, Black Boys Look Blue by the gay Black playwright Terrell Alvin, Alvin McCraney, was still directed by a straight Black man. Moonlight, despite not having been directed by a queer individual, is still a seminal film that holds extreme importance for the representation that the queer Black community deserves. Ray Jenkins, the director of Moonlight, said this of the film's paramount value. I felt that there was a lot of responsibility in the fact that we don't see movies that are centered on the coming of age of a young gay black man because there are so few of these depictions, the ones that do exist take on added importance. Even though Jenkins cannot personally identify with the film's queer themes, he is aware of how important it is for him to have created a film with a representation of queer black experiences. He's used his platform as a director to create art that is not only necessary and needed, but that broke through the white barriers of Hollywood. It forced white elites to engage with experiences so far from their own and to award the film's artistic and societal accomplishments. 
It can be said that getting the approval of old white art gatekeepers shouldn't matter, but the fact that Moonlight garnered the recognition it deserves is an exciting feat worthy of praise. Many individuals in their respective mediums voiced their frustrations with not having media representations of queer black men that they could look up to. One account that best summarizes this common feeling is that of Jamel who says, I wondered as a young boy, if I would have seen a black gay man on screen that I could relate to, if this would have led me down a path of acceptance rather than rejecting my true self. The sad but commonplace reality is that most queer BIPOC individuals have grown up with little to no rep positive representation of characters like themselves in media. Instead, they are faced with white examples or even negative tokenistic characters. When someone does not see themselves represented in the media they consume, they are not only invalidated and forgotten, but ultimately told their experience does not matter. Representation is so important for building the confidence, self-worth, self-acceptance, and worth of people early on in life. Jamel's speculation is accurate. If he and other queer Black men would have seen themselves represented positively in media, they would have been able to come to terms with their identity and present as their truer selves earlier on in life. Representation is of utmost value, yet queer Black individuals are still not given the character storylines and works they need. Moonlight is undoubtedly a great example, but it solely pioneered the way for other works like it to express uh, queer Black experiences and provide representation where it is due. At the end of his film, Tongues Untied, Marlon Riggs has the following phrase highlighted, Black men loving Black men is the revolutionary act. This phrase, written in white and standing alone against a stark black background, emphasizes the, oral me the overall message of the film and the final statement of the gay black director. Without a doubt, black gay men existing in their truth are living revolutionary existences. They fight back against heterosexual norms, black masculinity's negative stereotypes, and are unapologetically free and happy. They are no longer imprisoned by societal expectations that define what it means to be a man, a queer person, or a black individual. Many queer Black men embody all of their identities, grace, love, and pride, and aren't afraid to speak their truth. No longer do they fight a battle within themselves, but they also stand up against external naysayers without fear. Black gay men have transcended all limitations and expectations society has placed on them and have found self-acceptance and the ability to define and express themselves how they wish. All of the queer Black men who are featured in this work, along with members of their community and brotherhood, can answer fully and unabashedly the question, who is you, man? Because they know who they are at their core. And after a multitude of trials and hardships, they're no longer afraid to live authentically and free. <laughs> Thank you, Yadira. Thank you very much. Okay, we will come back uh, for questions. Um, in the meantime, we're going to hear from Caitlin. Hello, everyone. Um, so my presentation is about um, Tracy K. Smith's book of poetry, Wade in the Water, um, which examines racial and environmental injustice um, and participates in what Catherine R. Linz has termed African-American reclamation eco-poetics. So eco-poetics refers to any poetry that takes the natural world as its inspiration and subject. And whereas eco-criticism has traditionally focused on pastoral aesthetics, Linz and other Black critics have expanded eco-poetics to address environmental degradation and the structural oppressions that connect environmental damage with ongoing racial injustice through both formal and thematic elements. African-American reclamation eco-poetics is a protest of human injustices to both other humans and non-human nature and is a strong part of contemporary Black poetics. Wade in the Water connects environmental degradation and racial injustice and responds to these issues with a call for compassion, also entering current conversations about restorative justice for Black people in America. Wade in the Water identifies the link between racial injustice and environmental degradation, but at the same time, Smith's book is infused with a compassion that provides optimism in the face of oppression. The poems Wade in the Water and an old story in particular draw attention to the damage done to both the environment and Black people in America, countering these injustices with a compassion deemed essential to, to dismantling unjust systems and bringing about healing. The title poem, Wade in the Water, exposes the violence that extractive capitalism inflicts on both Black people and the land by evoking slavery, which was one of extractive capitalism's earliest manifestations. Smith wrote this poem after seeing the Geechee Gullah ring shouters perform. 
At first glance, Wade in the Water seems to be about a lively performance with hand claps and stomps. However, the dance in question has a tragic history that recounts the enslavement of the dancer's ancestors. Geechee Gola, which is the area along the Atlantic coast that includes parts of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, also refers to the enslaved people who worked there in cotton, rice, and indigo fields, as well as the unique language and art that evolved in this isolated region. The Geechee Gullah Ring Shouters perform dances and songs created when their ancestors were enslaved. Extractive capitalism relies on an underclass of exploited laborers created by the historical enslavement and disenfranchisement of African and indigenous populations and maintained by modern day anti-Black racism. Wade in the Water is rooted in extractive capitalism's long history of slavery, domination, and exploitation. The poem's description of the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag are then not simply an artful metaphor, but are the literal history of Geechee Gullah dance. The acknowledgement of the legacy slavery has left in the United States in Wade in the Water can be linked to environmental degradation. This legacy of human and natural plunder is depicted in the poem as the dancers pretend to wade in the water, invoking the water that carried enslaved people from Africa to the Geechee Gullah region. This description of the water where they pretended to wade in particular also allows the poem to hint at environmental degradation. In Wade in the Water, the Atlantic Ocean is metaphorically tainted by the forcible importation of enslaved Africans. But with the knowledge that extractive capitalism created slavery, it follows that the waters of the world also have been and will continue to be literally threatened by careless environmental practices. Angela Davis and Macarena Gomez Barris assert that extractive capitalism creates the need to dominate the land as well as people, stripping it of saleable resources and contaminating it with the toxic byproducts of, of production. Therefore, Wade in the Water participates in the tradition of African-American reclamation eco-poetics by articulating an understanding of the ways in which extractive capitalism links both environmental degradation and racial injustice. The second poem I want to talk about is an old story which closes Smith's book with a haunting image of the devastation caused by domination and exploitation of both the land and black bodies in the United States. Therein arguing that these inextricably linked injustices are structural, not individual. The poem voices a land that is livid and ravaged and a people whose every hate has swollen to a kind of epic wind, describing the damage done to both the earth and humans as the worst in us taken over. An old story asserts that individual beliefs become codified by the dominant group, making individual hate swell to epic proportions, cementing a structural injustice in the United States that is more far reaching than any one individual's action. That the poem presents the end of the world as something that involves both structural environmental degradation and institutionalized human hatred argues that when racial injustice goes unchecked, so does environmental degradation and vice versa. Because environmental degradation and racial injustice work together, these oppressions multiply for Black people. Black people not only face the daily threat of racial violence, but are also more likely to live in areas where the environment is poor due to environmentally harmful governmental policies and corporate actions that disproportionately affect poor communities of color. An old story asserts the structural nature of the problems of environmental degradation and racial injustice. Like Wade in the Water, an old story connects racial injustice and environmental degradation. However, an old story points this conversation toward future possibilities for compassionate change. The swollen hate and ravaged land build upon each other until they are countered in the poem with people taking new stock of each other and the land. An old story thus outlines the coming problems society will face if oppressive systems are not replaced by systems of justice and compassion. In this way, the poem reflects Lynn's argument that African-American reclamation ecopoetics take responsibility for the future, demanding stewardship of nature and, in a manner of speaking, of other humans. An old story, while condemning the injustices of the past, is also forward-looking, seeking to rectify past problems of environmental degradation and racial injustice in order to build a more equitable future for all. Wade in the Water contends that neither racial nor environmental injustices can be defeated without compassion. 
Indeed, the book underscores compassion as a force for liberation, justice, and healing, also offering a new way of envisioning the focus on the future of African-American reclamation ecopoetics. Wade in the Water as asserts that compassion leads to community, allowing effective resistance movements because it disavows hierarchy and acknowledges the problems people face, creating both individual and structural change. Wade in the Water and an old story in particular emphasize compassion as a weapon in the battle for human dignity and justice. However, I want to be really clear here that these poems do not suggest that one should just ignore the reality of, of racial injustice or rely on trite calls to just love everyone as the solution to systemic problems. The poems pair compassion with an acknowledgement of ecological disaster and racist violence because compassion requires that one acknowledge the injustices of the past and present in order to find healing in the future. Nor are calls for compassion a way to avoid concrete action because feeling with requires both individual and collective work. Compassion does not mean ignoring difficult realities, but instead allows us to confront these negative realities in a manner that is life affirming and life enhancing. Thus compassion in the sense Smith and other black theorists use it, motivates care and community to combat injustice and thus create a more equitable future. For instance, Wade in the Water personifies compassion, arguing that compassion itself has the power to temper injustice and loose chains. Smith describes one of the Geechee Gola ring shouters greeting her by saying, I love you. The woman repeats, I love you again and again as she continued down the hall past other strangers. In the poem, though the group does not know one another, they are all pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. Compassion is infused throughout the performance, manifesting itself in every hand clap, every stomp, in rusted iron chains and in the water. As compassion pierces the scene with light, the rusted iron chains of racial injustice and environmental degradation are unclasped and left empty. This image clearly communicates the immense power true compassion has to combat injustice. It is compassion itself, not any individual, that breaks the chains. Further, in the poem, compassion drags us to those banks and casts us in, as well as pushes itself into each audience member, scraping at each throat. Wade in the Water mimics a baptism and confirmation by the hand of compassion. That compassion itself performs these actions again illustrates its potency in resisting oppression. Compassion is not merely the motivator of liberation, it is the, liberty, the liberator itself. The book's final poem, An Old Story, invokes a creation myth of sorts to offer a vision of healing through compassion and argue that the structures of the world must be reimagined. An old story begins with a storm, ravaged land, and swollen hate, a picture of what the world might become if the twin oppressions of racial and environmental injustice are left unchecked. Eventually, however, something large and old awoke. This force causes the people in the story to take new stock of one another, begin to sing together, and weep to be reminded of such color. The large and old force coming back to life after being suppressed by hatred and destruction can be read as compassion, which reminds people of the brilliant and varied colors of the world. This awakening of compassion also brings healing to the ravaged land, replacing storms with a different manner of weather and coaxing animals long believed gone down from trees. Of an old story, Smith has written, I wrote this poem thinking it might be nice to take a stab at creating a new myth that takes the failings of the 21st century and fashions them into a story that culminates in humankind finding its way to a compassionate existence. The healing of relationships between humans themselves, as well as between humans and the natural world that takes place in the poem comes from a reassessment of how the world functions and whom those functions serve. This reassessment facilitates a creation of a society based on compassionate structures. Because the poem depicts a new society, it demonstrates compassion's ability to incite expansive structural change, not merely individual transformation and community support. An old story illustrates the way in which compassion gives social movements the power and scope to dismantle oppression at its roots. Near the beginning of Wade in the Water, we read, for our own good, we have to answer for all that has happened. The collection as a whole offers up compassion as a way to answer for the injustices described therein. 
Smith's book joins other contemporary Black liberation theorists like Bell Hooks, Brittany Cooper, and Charlene Carruthers in offering up a vision of a compassionate society that recognizes the value in all humanity and the earth, and that is committed to comprehensive structural change. For example, Cooper argues that compassion brings clarity that tells us what kind of world we want to see. And Carruthers adds that compassion helps us to identify connections and value people enough to believe we can be transformed. Compassion creates care for others and turns such care into action toward concrete change. Further, Akiba Solomon and Kenraya Rankin note in their book, How We Fight White Supremacy, A Field Guide to Black Resistance, that compassion is not a magical quick fix, but is a guiding force that creates an enduring form of resistance that is radical, expansive, and transformative at its core. Compassion guides people towards structural change and thus is essential to truly remove systems of domination at their roots, rather than focusing only on singular instances of oppression. In her touchstone essay, Poetry is Not a Luxury, Audre Lorde asserts that poetry forms the quality of light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change, thus laying the foundations for a future of change. Compassion makes the necessity of such change clear, but it is also the tool by which that change is accomplished. Poetry gives us a place to hint at possibility made real. In this vein, Wade in the Water creates a world in which to explore the radical revolution that compassion could enact if we let it guide our actions and institutions. Wade in the Water urges us to start cultivating such compassionate revolution. Thank you. Wonderful, thank, thank you, Caitlin. All right. Um, oh, and we see that Casey put um, some information in the chat, thank you. I wanna thank everyone for sticking to time. This is wonderful. So now we'd like to take questions for Yadira and Caitlin. Okay, go ahead, Kristen. Sorry, Dr. Matthews. Uh, well, thanks to all four panelists. Um, uh, I think it's such a strong slate of papers. And while you were looking at disparate genres or disparate questions, there were so many connections uh, between all four papers about the embodied experience of, of blackness or being mixed race in America and the ways in which different um, policing ideologies, right? Whether that be housing, redlining, whether that be uh, health and medical, whether that be those ideologies, anti-queer, anti-Black, um, and then bringing in the environment. I think that so many of you are talking about this very important embodied experience of Blackness. So thank you for that. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and it was also fun to see these in a new format. So thank you for that as well. Uh, to Maybe I'll just source something out to the whole panel, right? Um, this is something I was thinking about as I was listening to all of you and talking about, uh, as you talked about the kinds of changes that you want to see. And, and um, uh, in a book I teach often, uh, Tracy K. Smith's memoir, Ordinary Light, um, at the close of that, she talks about how her little daughter in her preschool set learns how to say, when we tell our stories, we make power. And I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about the role that telling these stories can play in making power. Okay, let's let's have Yadira and Caitlin. Um, why don't you go ahead first, and then if others want to add to that question. I can go first. Um, so one of the really important things about stories is that they help make us aware of experiences that are different than our own. And not only that, but they also help us um, sort of see people um, who are different than us as human and as full people. And this is something that, that Casey talked about a little bit um, when she was talking about how she tried to sort of layer her research with um, personal stories because those stories are really are really so important for us to see that like oh these people have similar experiences to me or different problems but we all have um 
problems and it helps it, these stories help create um, compassion. Um, and then the other reason that I think that stories are really important is um, this idea that ta Coates talked about in the, um, the Q&A he did with BYU students. Um, and he said something that I think about like once a week since ever since I heard it. Um, but he said, art is the place where the menu of what's possible gets um, determined and redetermined. So I think without these stories, we don't really know what's possible and we don't have any sort of vision for the future of what we want or sort of what we're working toward. Um, I guess building upon that, I touched on it briefly about how important representation is. Um, and it's important for other people to see experiences and realities outside of their own, um, but it's also, validating for those who share those experiences to see their own reality and, and um, yeah, to just understand that, that what they're experiencing and living is real and that people are aware of it. Okay, any other, let, let's see, I think, Kristen, were you asking Aisha and Casey to maybe chime in on that too? If if Casey and Aisha want to, then then they can. Um, they they don't have to. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'd I'd be happy to chime in just briefly. Um, I've thought about this a lot because once I decided I didn't want to go to medical school, I was like, and now I have an English degree. <laughs> like, and what does that do? And and not to be cynical or anything, but um, I think one thing I learned, especially in a class I took a couple years ago which explored like the fact that you know no matter where you are in the world no matter the culture no matter the people everybody tells stories like it doesn't matter everyone tells stories and it's a way like in evolutionarily scientists presume that like we've maintained order and we've maintained like connection with each other you survive with your tribe and so you in order to survive and bond you tell stories and so I think that now working in like the nonprofit sector, my perspective is that, you know, you can't get anything done if you don't have, you know, the, the empathy and you don't get the empathy if you just, you know, spill out a bunch of numbers, you get empathy by telling stories and by, and by, again, kind of like showing the shared humanity um no matter no matter the background or identity or or whatnot i can add something briefly as well i felt like that was one kind of limitation in the approach i took to my project that um i tried putting in two cents at the very end to be like hey these are individuals we're talking about here because usually the work that i do is very figurative very personal um, and it's even portraiture. And this was one where the only figures in it were like stick figures from a distance. And so I feel like, I think, you know, we need to come at these stories and these issues from every single angle. But that said, um, I had a fascinating discussion this week um, in one of my classes about the, one of the key parts of critical race theory is talking about the stories and the humanity of these people and not just minimizing a group of people to these um, very um, depressing, although truthful um, statistics. And so I, I appreciate um, the other um, panelists today that talk more about like the individual stories, because I think coming at it from all of those angles is essential. But can I just say, Aisha, that your visuals tell a story, right? There's such a narrative there um, within each each piece, but then among the pieces. So I wouldn't discount the power of story that comes from that visual representation. Just saying. Thank you. And I, I will say too, it was it's such a great group of papers, all these different perspectives um, to have. Other questions? We have time for a few more questions, maybe two more questions. <laughs> Okay, I have a question um, and uh, 
particularly from Yadira and Caitlin, thinking about your papers and how it maybe started with literature but branched off into different topics, which always happens with literature, right? It's, it's how we understand the way to understand the world that we live in. Um, and I'm, I was just wondering what, what were some things that surprised you as you branched out or maybe there were some things that you really wanted to bring in um, in conversation with the literature that you already were aware of? I hope that makes sense, that question. Could you clarify what you mean by like surprising? <laughs> Maybe you went in a different direction with uh, different sources or um, that may maybe re reaching out into film um, or environmental studies um, or compassion, those, those topics, um, maybe they, that was a surprising thing or maybe that was something that you already had in mind and it just made sense. Um, I guess I can answer first. I, um, when I proposed my project, I did bring up the idea that I wanted to use other mediums aside from literature. Um, I, I, I'm like I love film, <laughs> so I wanted to bring that into it. Um, just the the visual aspect and of people, um, I guess, speaking comfortably and in a way that isn't like academic, but it's available to others. Um, I guess something that was surprising for me, I guess, in my um, my writing process was that I had to narrow down um, the experiences of the people that I wanted to talk about because a lot of the documentaries also um, featured trans experiences um, and I unfortunately could not, uh, I didn't have the space to feature those important experiences, but I think that's what was surprising for me was having to figure out um, who I wanted to focus on. Um, so as I, as I was doing my research, um, I originally was just going to sort of contrast um, the way Smith talks about compassion with with the way Bell Hooks talks about compassion. She actually has like a trilogy of books that she wrote about love um, and social justice. Um, but as I talked about this with Dr. Matthews, she really pushed me to to see you know, like what are more contemporary people saying about this as well. And I was surprised by how many um, contemporary black social justice activists and theorists were um, discussing compassion because it's something that we sort of uh, don't talk about. We talk about we talk about love and compassion and social justice in, in conjunction with Martin Luther King Jr. And then we kind of forget about it. And I think this is partially um, partially due to good intentions because compassion has been a way to sort of like virtue signal without actually doing the work. And so um, I think people shy away from it because they don't wanna be perceived as saying like, I, I just think everybody should love each other and, and not doing anything that's actually important. Um, but I also think that compassion is read as feminine. Um, and that is also another thing that we do not really value in our society you know we we love to talk about social justice and power and um and fighting for equality in terms of battles and hierarchy and like work and like smashing the patriarchy and like destroying white supremacy and those are things that obviously need to happen um but we do also need to be aware of the ways that the the ways we talk about it sort of play into the the ideals of white supremacy and patriarchy um, and need to to branch out and and maybe think about some other metaphors we might want to use. Great, thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna abuse my powers as the moderator and ask one last question to all of you. Um, I wondered how your projects changed you as a person. Can I go first? <laughs> um, so this project was extremely important to me. Um, I actually came up with it because um, in Dr. Matthews class, the capstone class that I wrote this paper for, um, she didn't have a lot of 
queer um, works that we were reading. So I wanted to do my own research. Um, and I am, I uh, identify as queer. Um, so this was like really personal to my own um, story, my own um, identity. And I feel like through the research that I did, um, uh, it was it, like I had my own journey of like self acceptance and um, like figuring out who I was and being able to, um, I guess, present unapologetically, you know. So yeah, for for me, it was um, it was really great. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Hadira. Okay, others. I can I can go next. Mine's I wish mine were as optimistic. My takeaway is trust no one. <laughs> um, no, I think that um, I think for me, you know, I I guess like I've kind of always looked at a career or professional um, path with a lot of optimism and a lot of hope and just kind of like, you know, they know what they're doing. Everyone knows what they're doing. And I think that to, there was like a level of, you know, privilege I had to confront and also like naivete, just like, like what I assumed were strong and like all encompassing systems that are supposed to help people. They haven't, they're not helping people. And frankly, they haven't for a really long time. And I think that is like discouraging at like best but I think too for me that one of the reasons I'm not pre-med anymore is because I've I feel so much more fulfilled by doing this type of research and this type of work and now I'm actually working in the nonprofit sector to kind of help elevate um students from you know lower socioeconomic strata students of color queer people I also identify as queer shout out um just like I, I get to be able to do that in my day to day. And for and for me to do that um, professionally, I feel like is super fulfilling and it's helped me understand like, it's not just like the systems are, are bad, but the systems can change. And it's the people who are creating the systems and working within them that are actually getting to do that change. And so um, I think it's definitely helped inform, you know, how I, how I approach my own work and how I'm kind of seeing my own career moving forward. Thank you, Casey. I can go next. Um, I think um, on on more a broader level, it made me very um, aware of where I grew up and the places that I grew up and also the stereotypes that I heard about places where I did not grow up. So I think that's something that hopefully we can all relate to and recognize in that essay. But um, for me, on a more personal and maybe unique level was um, the research that went into where mixed race people and mixed race households fit within the housing market, because that's something that is not researched um, that much yet. And so um, just learning about all the ways that, um, you know, I, I'm mixed, but I'm white passing in a lot of ways and a lot of circumstances. And um, I think um, it made me very aware of colorism and just the plethora of systematic things that are in place that have allowed me to kind of go through life very unscathed, I think is the word that comes to mind. And so I think um, it made me really, uh, I think, confront things like white privilege, but also like light skinned mixed privilege as well in a certain regard. I think also as far as an institutional level, I mean, kind of like what Casey was saying, it's kind of really depressing to see like, oh, here's all these people that are trying to make a change, but here's how it's not really happening. And so um, I think it made me very much want to continue on um, and research whatever, whatever direction that'll take me in because um, I think research does a lot to be able to tell us what's actually going on um, for policymakers to make um, changes, so. Thank you, Caitlin, oh, go ahead. Yeah, those are all, those are all great. Um, points and I've been really interested to hear about your guys' um, uh, experiences. And my paper, I think um, in one way, it kind of changed the way I think about literature 
because I have I have for a long time seen literature sort of like as a tool of critique and you know pointing out the ways that the systems of the world um, fail us. But um, I think it's also a really important um, vehicle for emotion and for um, affect. And so that, so that has been sort of like a change in the way I think about literature. But I also have, it also has sort of pushed me to um, think about my own actions and the way that I do sometimes use compassion as a way to avoid concrete action and to say like, well, I'm not a racist. So, you know, um, and, and sort of distance myself from these, these structures of oppression rather than actually, you know, looking for um, action steps I can personally take. Um, and so it has, it has sort of prompted a little bit of, of soul searching and trying to find more, um, more active ways to be um, an anti-racist beyond just sort of, you know, like reading books by black people and taking African-American literature classes. Like what, like what am I doing in the real world? Great, thank you, Caitlin. Okay, we we're over time a little bit, but um, we've got one last question from Pamela. And I'm gonna ask you to each um, answer it in like one or two words so that we can just quickly go through it. And, and her question is, um, what, after doing all this research, what will you do with it? So going along with what Caitlin was saying, what, what will you do with it and how will you use it? So just short words. For me, I think action, obviously, as I was saying, but then also um, grad school is my plan. <laughs> All right, thanks, Caitlin. Um, similar to Caitlin, grad school, and um, this is not two words, sorry, um, art that continues to teach about what I am learning and continues to teach audiences. Great, thank you. And Aisha's uh, work was displayed in the HVAC for a little while, so that's good. Yeah. Okay, Nadir and Casey? Um, <laughs> publish question mark? <laughs> <laughs> Great word. And, <laughs> question mark off. <laughs> and keep going. So I don't know, I don't know about grad school yet, but yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't really know how to answer this question. <laughs> um, I feel like one word I would use or like two uh, would be like personal because this was like a personal thing for me. Um, and like growth, um, like my own growth and like how I view others. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to all of you. I think, yes, we can round of applause for everyone. Um, I. Uh, don't want to keep you too much longer. Thank you for all of those who stayed this long on Zoom. We're almost here for two hours, so that's a pretty good feat. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and announce the awards. Uh, we had um, four great uh, papers or projects that were accepted for the symposium. And we've in the past had the paper awards. Um, and then we had a creative work. So we decided to give the three paper awards and award Aisha uh, for her creative work and kind of have a new category of awards. And we hope that students will in the future um, uh, submit more different types of, of work that they're doing in their classes. So we may change our symposium in the future um, because of that. So thank you, Aisha. So that's a round of applause for Aisha for her great work. Um, and then for the student paper awards, uh, we awarded first place to Casey Sorensen for improving health outcomes for black women by correcting physicians implicit bias. And the second place to Caitlin Holzer for something large and old awoke. And then Yadira uh, Veomatao, I'm sorry, I keep saying that differently and I really apologize, uh, black queer here a small collection of black gay male voices. 
So, and all of you, congratulations. Thank you so much. You all did great work, which is why you were accepted and why we asked you to present. So I hope you will all feel great about the work you did. And I will be in touch with you about the, um, how to get the money. We're, we're gonna figure that out um, <laughs> with Zoom and, and um, see who's on campus and able to, to come and, and take that. And finally, I'd like to announce, we have an award in Africana Studies for faculty who have um, given a, a significant contribution to Africana Studies at BYU and um, even in, in general. Um, and this year we are awarding that to Connie Lamb, who has been in the library. Uh, we learned in December that Connie retired and which is probably why she's not here with us right now. Oh, she is here. That's you, Connie. Okay. <laughs> she just barely, this is partly what Connie does, right? She is so faithful and comes and um, we really appreciate her. Um, even if she only has a number on her <laughs> screen and I didn't know that was her. I'm so glad you're here, Connie. We, um, Connie came in uh, as when a Mark Grover retired. And so Connie already had expertise in um, Middle Eastern studies and in women's studies, but she was so enthusiastic about uh, diving in and helping us in Africana studies. And I think we all really appreciated her support for all of our um, events and meetings. And uh, we even got to share a room at a conference once, which was fun. Um, even though it wasn't for very long, it was so nice to have um, her there at, Afri at African Studies Association meeting. Um, so before she got too far away from BYU, we wanted to um, congratulate her and thank her for all that she's done. So we can give her a round of applause. And I don't know, Connie, if you've made it to your office yet, but we um, awarded Connie a certificate and a nice bag um, from after the African Roots um, uh, is a, a refugee owned um, business in Salt Lake. And so she gets this nice African bag that she can take all the fun things she's gonna do with her around now that she's retired. So um, I, I, I would like to, um, if Connie, if you'd like to say something, I'll give you a chance in a moment. I just wanted to say also that we're really grateful that Chantal Thompson is here. And this award is named after her because of all the work she did to establish Africana Studies at BYU. And we're grateful that she could be with us. She was recently, as soon as she retired, she went off to, to West Africa to serve a mission with her husband and is now um, back with us. So I don't know if Connie or Chantal, if you'd like to say anything before we finish up. I would. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Connie. Okay. Go ahead. Chantel, I thank you uh, for all your good work and getting the program going again. And Leslie has taken it by the horns and done a great job. I'm really pleased to see how the Africana Studies program has grown. Um, and thank you so much for this award. It's, it's uh, really surprising, but I appreciate it. I really enjoyed learning about Africa and about um, and associating with, uh, with the faculty that taught in that area. It's been a great experience for me. So thank you very much for the award. And uh, I would like to say that um, it really pleases me to see uh, these students uh, perform and uh, get excited about Africana studies and Africana issues. Um, I spent a summer in 1995 in um, Senegal. And when I came back, I went to the BYU administration and I said, why don't we have an African program here? It says the world is our campus, uh, what about Africa? And uh, they said, well, would you like to start a committee and so that's how it started. And I ended up, uh, I mean, it was, it was hard work. It was hard work to get people on board. Uh, but uh, 
after all this time, we, we did it. And uh, then it went from African studies to Africana studies. And I was so pleased to pass it on to um, Leslie Hadfield, who is a, a great person and a great uh, coordinator for the, for the program. And uh, I, half of my heart is still in Africa and uh, I'm sure I'll be going back. Um, and uh, it's a great honor to have this award uh, named after the, the person who started the program and directed it for 15 years. Thank you. We're so glad you could be here today and same with you, Connie. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thank you. Yes, I hope you enjoy your weekend. We made it almost to four o'clock, which again, that's, that's quite a thing on Zoom. So go um, reward yourself with ice cream or something. <laughs> All right, take care, everyone. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.